Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 4. Now, this is a very, very important chapter because we're going to see how Jesus dealt with the devil. We're going to see how he did it. And I'm going to give you keys and clues that you probably never heard before. We're also going to be talking about him and how he was rejected at Nazareth after he uh, went through the temptation in the wilderness. We're going to be talking about how he cast out an evil spirit, and we're going to be talking about how Jesus healed many. Let's start out with verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, or Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You know, now, sometimes God can lead you in the wilderness. A lot of people need to go through the wilderness. What good is the wilderness? Well, you know, the wilderness is a place, it is a place of temptation. It is a place of testing. It is a place where you can get your eyes off the big city and the big lights and off of the material things and out of, you know, you get your eyes off of just, you know, the common everyday thing. And you're in the wilderness. You're in trial, okay? And so God can lead you in that, okay? Lead you into a wilderness, lead you into trial, like he did with Yeshua, like he did with Jesus. Verse 2, for 40 days being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing in those days. Afterward, they were com afterward when they were completed, he was hungry. Notice it says after the 40 days, he was hungry. Hmm. It doesn't say that he was really hungry during, although it, he could have been. Verse 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God. Now, we know that the devil knew who he was. But again, the devil here is just tempting him. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, the devil knows that if he really is the son of God and as, as a son of God, you share in the same nature of God that you can command a stone to become bread because, you know, after all, God created the whole universe with mere words. Jesus answered him and said, Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, that is in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Now, there is a clue here, and I'm going to get to this in just a few minutes. But I want you to notice a pattern here, okay? Jesus quoted the scripture. Now, this is from, and on a very surface level. You can say, Jesus could have said to him, okay, he could have argued with him and said, you're the devil. You know who I am. You saw, uh, you know, basically, you knew me for thousands of years. Um, I am God incarnate. I, 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 I am, I'm the one that created the world. And that's exactly what it teaches in, you know, in the scriptures here that we read. Jesus could have said, oh, Satan, you know who I am. I am the son of God. That's it. That settles it. I'm telling you, I am. He, he could have just said, he could have just argued like in that way. He could have said, well, didn't you, weren't you just, uh, don't you know that weren't you there uh, when, when God uh, himself, God the Father said, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Like just, just a little while ago when I got baptized, you know, uh, didn't you hear that? He didn't say any of that, you know. He didn't argue in that way. He argued in a very specific, very strategic way. And I'm going to get to this, okay? Take note. Verse 5. The devil, leading him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's a supernatural thing. So the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world, it says here, like, and in, in in that vision, uh, I'm sure the devil showed him all the wealth of the world, you know, all the power, you know, kingdoms are, you know, there are they are domains of power. 
power, wealth, possession. The devil showed him all this. Verse 6, the devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And it and I give it to, to whom to whomever I want. If you, therefore, will worship will worship before me, it will be all yours. Verse 8. Jesus answered him, Get behind me, Satan. In other words, you can also take that to mean get back, Satan. Or get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and, and you shall serve him only. And that is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Notice again, Jesus quoted scripture to the devil. Now, notice what Jesus did not say. Okay? He did not question the devil's authority at all. He didn't say, you don't have the authority. You don't have the authority over all these kingdoms of the earth. You don't have their glory. You know, it hasn't been delivered to you. Now, you can say that Jesus, by lack of that um, rebuttal, by lack of that rebuttal by Jesus, you can say that Jesus acknowledged by omission that the devil did have this authority and that it was delivered to him. How do you say it would have been delivered to, to the devil? Well, you look back in Genesis. It says God created Adam, and God said that he gave Adam all the authority over, over the world, basically. God, God gave Adam the authority, okay? But Adam surrendered that authority when he sinned. He surrendered that authority when he sinned. He gave that authority, basically, um, he surrendered or he submitted, more or less. He listened to the woman, and the woman listened to the devil. So you got, instead of Adam being on top, you know, the man, the head of the house, and then the, the, the woman being in submission, and the devil being in submission to both of them, um, you know, on, on, the, on the bottom, it was turned opposite. The devil was, uh, the woman was in submission to the devil because the woman listened to the devil. And the man was in submission to the woman because the man listened to the woman. So the man was, has given his authority to the woman who gave the authority to the devil. So the devil did have the authority. That is why Jesus did not argue saying, oh, Satan, you don't have the authority. It hasn't been delivered to you. How can you say it was delivered to you? How can you, you know, how can you say that you have the authority over all the kingdoms of the earth and, and that you can give that authority and that glory, the beauty and the, the wealth thereof to whomever you want? No, he just answered Satan with scripture. Now, there's something a lot deeper that I'm going to get to in just a moment. Okay, but let's read on here first. Verse nine, he led him to Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here. For it is written, He will put his angels charge of you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest, you, lest perhaps you dash your foot against a stone. So the devil quoted from the book of Psalms. Chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. Hmm, Psalm 91. That's a favorite to a lot of Christians, okay? But Jesus answered and said, It has, it has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, Jesus came back with Scripture. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Jesus said, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. Verse 13, when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him until another time. Okay. That other time would have been on the cross, but we'll get to that. 
Now, I, I got two great things I want to share with you. Now, n- let's not forget that w- we are reading a document here, the gospel or the good news according to Luke. This was written by a Jew in the culture of a Jew, the Jewish culture, about the king of the Jews, Yeshua. Now, what you don't read here, because a lot of things is just, what would you say? It's just assumed or insinuated that you already know that. But what you don't read here, let me just back up a second. There's a lot of things that is not written in the Bible. Like we read this in John. John said, if everything was written that the, that the Lord did, that Jesus did, that even the world itself wouldn't be able to contain the books uh, that would contain all of the works of Jesus. So there's a lot of things that are not included in the Gospels, okay? The Gospel doesn't tell you how many steps Jesus took from, from the baptism to the wilderness. It doesn't tell you, you know, how... It, 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 the, it, the Gospel doesn't say here that Jesus had to, to breathe, <laughs> but we all know he was breathing. We all know it doesn't say here his heart was beating, but we all know his heart was beating. There are certain things that we just know that it doesn't have to be said. In the same way... In the Jewish mind, in a Jewish culture, there are things that are just known that just is not said because it's just assumed that everybody already knows this. One of it is that in the Jewish mind, again, in order to defeat the devil, there's only one way to defeat the devil. That is through the Torah. Okay? That is... That is what Jews say. That's the that's the unspoken belief of the Jews, okay? The Jewish culture. One way to defeat Satan, the Torah. One way to defeat Satan, the Torah. Now, look again back, okay? Let's go back here to verse 4. Man shall not live by uh, bread alone, but by every word of God. And this is what Jesus quoted to the devil. What is that? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. It's the Torah. Go down again to verse 8. Jesus said, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What did Jesus quote there? Did he quote from the prophets? Did he quote from the historical writings of, of the Tanakh? No. He quoted again from the Torah. Is that a coincidence? Well, let's go on and see the last thing that he quoted. Verse 12, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, this is from the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 6, verse 16. Jesus quoted from the Torah at every turn. Every time that he had to resist Satan. Every time he had to defeat us had had to defeat Satan or had to defeat the devil on a certain level, every time he quoted the Torah. That, my friend, I'm telling you, is not coincidence. Jesus, as a Jew, as the king of the Jews, as a Jewish rabbi, also followed through with the Jewish mindset and the Jewish culture and the Jewish belief system that that the devil can be defeated only by Torah. There's power in that. Okay, so the Jewish Bible is called the Tanakh. In the in the modern day Christian Bible, uh, it would be the quote unquote Old Testament. The Tanakh is uh, like an acronym. T N K. T for Torah, N for Nevaim, and K for Ketavim. T, Torah, meaning guidelines, instructions, law of God, the law, okay? Which is typically referred to, uh, re- referring to the law of Moses or the law of Moshe. Although not always, because we see later on, Jesus talked about the law of God and, and quoted saying, this is written in your law, but it's not necessarily the Torah. Uh, it's other parts of the scripture. But this is, again, we're looking at 
the, the Jewish mindset of today, TNK, Tanakh, the Christian way of saying it is quote unquote Old Testament. T being Torah, the guidelines, instructions, and rules of God. N being Nevaim, which, which means the prophets. Okay, we got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, uh, Micah, and on and on and on. K v, me, uh, is, stands for Ketavim, which means just simply writings. Okay, and that includes the historical books, you know, like uh, Chronicles and such. And in like Psalms as well is considered to be part of the Ketavim. Now, it's also important to understand the, um, the hierarchy of power, uh, the hierarchy of authority in the Jewish mindset. Now, I, you know, we've made a point here that Jesus follows and followed the Jewish mindset in regards to the Torah being the only way to defeat Satan. But let's go a little bit deeper. The Jewish mindset is that the Tanakh, the Torah, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, you know, comprises the, uh, I guess you would call it like the Bible, even though they didn't have Bible per se in those days. It was all written individually on scrolls. Uh, today it's called the Tanakh. There are different levels of authority. Okay. Not every book is created equal. In the Jewish mindset, in the Jewish, in, in, in um, how will I say it? In Jewish culture. Um, not every book is created equal. Deuteronomy is not created, is not, does not have the same place and power and authority as another book. Uh, for example, um, the book of Ruth, for example. Okay, or the book of Esther. Okay, um, each book has got their own place in the hierarchy of power and authority. Why is that? Because from a Jewish mindset, they they again you got to look at it from in in context in the culture where Jesus uh, was. Okay, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have it all thrown together in one convenient little book and called you know the Bible, the Holy Bible. No. It, every book of the Bible was kept separately on separate scrolls in the synagogue in separate places. And this was for a reason. And by the way, may I make the point it, that Jesus had no problem with that. He never said anything against the way it was done back in those days. Okay. He had things against the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. He had things against the practices of the, the, the Pharisees. But he never said anything about the practices or the doctrine of how the scrolls were kept in different places and kept at different, uh, in individual, you know, individual places, um, maintaining and preserving each of it of their own each scroll of its own individuality okay please follow me here please follow me this is powerful if you can grasp this okay so the torah or the books of moshe the books of moses was instantly uh i guess you might call it canonized in the in the in the minds in the mind of the children of israel nobody had to canonize it or authenticate it or, uh, you know, um, certify that it was really the word of God. No. Why? Because Moshe was like the most powerful, if not one of the most powerful, the most powerful uh, men of God uh, prior to uh, the Lord Jesus uh, himself. The entire nation of Israel saw for themselves the works of God. They saw and they heard the voice of God. It was so powerful in those days. It was with such demonstration and such power that the whole nation said to Moses, begging him, listen, 
you go. I, we can't bear this voice anymore. We can't bear this power anymore. You go by yourself and talk to God for us. You go get these instructions for yourself. We trust you. You do it. We can't bear this anymore. This is too much power. If we hear this, if we hear God's voice anymore, we will die. Nobody had to canonize. Nobody had to authenticate. God himself authenticated it by his presence, by his power, by the demonstration thereof. Okay? Nobody doubted that. Nobody. When the, when the prophets came along, they weren't instantly canonized in the sense that not everybody believed everything they said uh, in, in that way. Uh, sometimes it took hundreds of years for it to be you know, considered to be authentic, holy scripture. Uh, the Ketavim, the writings, was even of a lesser, um, you know, down lower on the, on the, on the scale of authority and, 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 uh, and you know, the weight thereof. Uh, I've read that, you know, according, according to Oxford University, in the studies uh, came, that came out of there, in the publications that came out of there, or Oxford Press, um, the book of Psalms, for example, itself wasn't even considered to be canonized or authentically pre, um, um, certified as canonized scripture until a couple hundred years after Jesus. Okay? So you got this, this scale of power and authority. The Torah being the top. With the great having the greatest authority, the 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 prophets having lesser authority, okay, and the Ketuvim or the writings having the least of the authorities of of all three. Consider Numbers chapter twelve, when you know we got Aaron and um, and Miriam. Um, uh, Moses' sister and Moses' brother that basically said, oh, look at this Moses. You know, he can't even talk right. Like he's, you know, he's, uh, he's um, handicapped. He's, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, for lack of a, <laughs> I don't want to use any terms here that's not, uh, you know, too offensive here, but you know what I'm talking about. He's, he, and look at the way he can't even talk. If God can use him, he can use us. We know Moshe. We know Moses. He's just our brother. Ah, if God can use him, look at the way he is. He can't even talk. If God can use him, he can use us. And God came down, and because of Miriam, especially Miriam, that would be Mary, uh, in the New Testament, the, the word would be called, uh, his, her name, excuse me, would be called Mary. Uh, Miriam, Mo Moses' uh, sister, um, especially, was really, uh, really, really um, suffered the wrath of God over that whole ordeal. God was so angry, God came down in his glory and in his presence and rebuked Aaron, rebuked Miriam, especially Miriam, saying, listen, Moses, I speak face to face, not like any of the other prophets. The other prophets, I speak in dark visions and riddles and dreams. But Moses, I speak face to face, clearly and plainly. How dare you say, how dare you think that you can be just as good as Moses? You are far from the truth, more or less. And God struck Miriam with a skin disease. Okay, because of her mouth. Uh, so, you know, again, there's, there's uh, from the Jewish concept, you know, sara'at, uh, skin disease, uh, can be a, uh, a punishment of God for uh, people's mouth being used in the wrong way. So be careful, as Jesus said, be careful what you say. Every single idle word can be used against you and will be used against you on the day of judgment. So, after God rebuked Miriam and Aaron harshly, God left and Miriam was left with a very serious skin disease. The point of the, the story is this. God made it very clear that Moses was in a higher place, higher authority than, than any of the other prophets. So therefore, the Torah is, got the most weight 
the most authority, the most power. The, Nev the Nevi'im, the prophets, are under that. And the Ketavim is under that. Now, having said that, I hope you're following me. I hope you, st you know, stay tuned here, okay? Um, having said that, Yeshua, Jesus, knowing that, used the Torah against the devil, knowing that the Torah has the greatest authority. The greatest power was in the writings of the Torah. And so that's why he used it against the devil. He didn't use, you know, Esther against the devil. He didn't use, uh, you know, Ezra. He didn't use, you know, the book of Daniel. He used the book of Deuteronomy, which is considered to be the Torah of God, okay? One of the books of the Torah. Now, the devil himself, he noticed that Jesus was quoting Scripture, to him, to defeat him. So he thought, okay, if you're going to quote scripture, I'm going to quote scripture to you. So he quoted scripture back to him. You remember, uh, let's go back again here to verse 10, or let's go to verse 9. He led, this is, uh, the devil led him, which is Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pin pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down from here, for it is written, for it is written. He will put his angels in charge of you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest perhaps you dash your foot against a stone. And that's in Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Now, look at this. Jesus used the highest of all the scriptures. Jesus used the highest authority to come against the devil. The devil, in quoting scripture back to him, used the lowest authority, the Psalms, the Ketavim, which, again, according to Oxford Press, it wasn't even uh, considered to be officially canonized until long after the death and resurrection of Yeshua. Now, you need to understand the context and the implication here. The book of Psalms in this, in the days of Jesus was like the hymn book in Christ, in churches today. It's like uh, you go in, in a church, it's like if, if someone's quoting the Bible to you and you pull the hymn book out and quote that back to him. You know what I mean? Now you see what I'm saying here? This is kind of like what the devil did to Jesus. Now, also notice that the devil used Psalm 91 to quote back to Jesus. And this is a favorite psalm of a lot of Christians. Christians should be having the Torah as their favorite over the book of Psalms. You know, some people read the book of Psalms just for comfort. Oh, that God would, would protect them and God would look after them and set his angels charge over them and yada, yada, yada. But if they don't go by the Torah... How can you expect God to protect you? How? Finally, now Jesus uh, said here, it says, when the devil had completed every temptation, this is in, in verse 13, every temptation, you might say, well, that's not every temptation. I can tell you a lot more different temptations that the devil could have tempted Jesus with than just bread and, you know, and uh, uh, throwing himself down off the temple and, and, and expecting angels to, to catch him or, or, um, or, or just worshiping the devil. Uh, well, you got to understand here. Spiritually speaking, there are three roots of sin. Three roots, okay? Uh, one of them is, okay, let, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 for a minute, okay? Genesis chapter 3, when Satan tempted Eve to eat of the fruit, he used the three roots of sin, okay? John, the apostle, in his epistles wrote that there, there are, uh, he said, whoever is... Um, a friend of the world is an enemy of God for whatever's of the world, whatever's in the world is not of the Father. For what's, you know, of the what's in the world and what's of the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Okay? Those three things are 
the root, those three things are the, the, the three main categories of sin. Every sin that you could ever name, every crime in God's eyes can be boiled down to one of these three categories. The lust of the flesh, okay, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, okay? The lust of the flesh, material things, which means money, which means material things, which means food. Lust of the eyes, which is very, that's very, um, you know, self-explanatory there, just beauty, what you see. And the lust of, or excuse me, the pride of life. The, the, the scriptures speak a lot of things against pride, okay? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He says, one of the seven deadly sins is a proud look. One of the seven things that says the Lord hates is a proud look, okay? So, when in, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, and I want to make this as brief as is. I want to wrap this up as, as fast as possible here, but I want to encourage you to do your, to do your homework here and, and, and do your studies. In Genesis chapter 3, when the devil tempted Eve to eat the fruit, it says that she saw that the fruit was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Okay. Good for food, that's lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, there's the lust of the eyes. And desirable to make one wise, there's the pride of life. Of course, this is not godly wisdom, wisdom of God, but this is wisdom according to the world standards, okay? So, sin came into the world through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. The devil tempted Jesus through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Let me explain a little bit more before I move on here. In verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. That's the lust of the flesh, especially when you're super hungry, when you haven't ate for 40 days. That's the lust of the flesh. Okay? Um, verse Five, the devil leading him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory, their beauty. Look, I'll sh I showed you all of the beauty. This is the lust of the eyes. Okay. Now again, go down again to verse nine. He, being the devil, led him, Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of the temple. Put him way up high up there, way up on the top. And said to him, If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down from, from here. For it's written, He will put his angels in charge of, you, in charge of you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest, you, uh, lest perhaps you dash your foot against a stone. So, that's pride. You're up high. You're exalted. You're, you're showing yourself to everybody. You, you, you are full of uh, presumption. You're just like, God will do this for me. But Jesus said, no, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Coming back down to humility. Do not test. Don't be so proud to think you can tempt or test the Lord your God. Okay? So, there you have it, okay? So it, it, very, very important to understand this stuff uh, in your struggle against the devil, okay? And uh, I would say that every single Christian, every true Christian that is alive in the world and everyone that's ever been alive and every, every Christian that ever will be will face temptation. So you, know, you got to know how to deal with it. You got to deal with it through the Torah, you got to be right with God according to the Torah. You got to deal with it through the Torah. You got to know your Torah above all. You got to know the laws, the, the guidelines, the rules, the instructions of God. You got to know your stuff. Okay? 
As, as Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. Study. Study. Okay? So that's very, very important. Very, very important. And, and to resist the lust of the flesh. When you're tempted with money, with material things, with sex, with, with, with food, do not cave in. Do not fall in that temptation. When you're tempted with the lust of the eyes, do not cave in. Do not fall into that temptation. When you're tempted with pride, thinking that you can just test the Lord, and you can just assume, put a, you just presume things and assume things on God. A lot of people do that, even in the church. A lot of churchgoers. You know, I, especially what comes to mind now is a lot of, not everyone, but a lot of charismatic Christians, a lot of Pentecostal Christians. They are, they, they just assume and presume, presumptuously they prophesy. Presumptuously they speak for, speak for God. Presumptuously. That's pride. Let's pray that we are humble men and women of God. Humble. Very, very important. God it says in Micah, what does God require of you? That you do, that you love mercy, that you do justly, that you do right, and you walk humbly with your God. That is what God requires of you. Okay? God wants you to be humble. God wants you to stay right with him, to repent of your sins. Okay. That's why God said over and over again, you know, um, that he doesn't, he's not looking for sacri animal sacrifice. And a lot of people think, well, animal, you know, just sacrifice, sacrifice, God will look after you. Oh, but you know, you sacrifice your sin, sacrifice, you're, you're being taken care of. God says, no, you keep your sacrifices to yourself. If, if that doesn't help you to repent, then it's worthless. It's, it's in vain. Sacrifices, animal sacrifices were, were supposed to be for, the purpose of it is, is to help you to connect uh, with that sacrifice and repent. Again, ask any Jewish guy, any ask any Jewish rabbi, uh, what was the purpose of sin sacrifices? You would be amazed uh, to find out. You need to learn. Uh, we need to all do our studies and learn a lot more uh, in regards to the culture of the Bible, biblical culture, which I assure you is for the most part Jewish culture. By the way, a lot of people say, oh, that's that's for the Jews. That, the law is for the Jews. The Torah is for the Jews. No, it's not Jewish law. I'm not talking about Jewish law. And there is such thing as Jewish law. I'm not talking about Jewish law. I'm talking about God's law. Okay? Jewish law is law that's on top of God's law. That's That's in addition to God's law. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God's law as shown to us in the pages of the scripture. Verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and news about him spread throughout all, through all the surrounding area. He taught in their synagogues, okay, being glorified by all. Again, Jesus didn't go to church. As a Christian, you're supposed to uh, take Jesus as your primary example. He didn't. He he could have said right right there and then after his temptation, after you know, after he basically tempt, got tempted of the devil, and he went in you know into Galilee in the power of the Spirit, as it says here in verse 14. He could have just said, "Okay, guys, now we're going to start a church here." Okay, Peter, you're the rock, and and, and this is we're going to start our own little new church. We're going to build our building, and and we're going to meet here, and uh, this is going to be our meeting place, and we're going to meet every Sunday. That is not what Jesus said. Not. I had a pastor said to me uh, recently. Well, you know, if you don't go to church, then, you know, it's, it's unbiblical. I said, going to church really is unbiblical. They met house to house and they went to synagogues, not churches. Synagogues. That is Jewish, okay? Jewish, okay? Jesus taught in their synagogues. Again, he could have started something new. He did not. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
he entered, as was his custom, again, as was his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, again, uh, I found very interesting. I was talking to a rabbi a few years ago that said that um, it is commonly, well, it is believed by some Messianic Jew, Jewish people that uh, in this particular um, circumstance here, in this particular story, Jesus was, it was his time to read the Torah portion, okay? And if you know anything about, again, Jewish custom, you read the Torah, you read, and you read, you read something from the Torah, or somebody might go up and read something from the Torah, and somebody else might go up and read something from the Nevi'im, the, the prophets, okay? So it says here, again, look at this, verse 16, Verse 16, he entered as was his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So that means he, he would go there all the time, okay? He would be going to the synagogue on a regular basis, okay? That was, that was what Jesus did. What would Jesus do? WWJD, go to the synagogues, okay? So he went to the synagogue, and again, if you know Jewish culture, you know that when you go to synagogue on a regular basis, there, there is what they call Torah portions, you know, that they read, you know, every week or every day where you, somebody would read from the Torah, somebody would read from the Nevi'im, and you would take turns and such. Now it says here in verse 17, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now, it is believed by some Jewish people that Jesus, uh, at this point in time, it was Jesus' turn to read the, from the book of Isaiah. It wasn't so much that, that he just all of a sudden, out of the blue, took out the, bo the book of uh, Isaiah kind of like unexpectedly and people really just, uh, you know, it was shocked. Oh, Jesus would never read. He never usually reads. Why? You just, you just jump out like just unexpectedly and, and read from the book of Isaiah. No, this was something that they all expected. That they knew this is what this is what happens. This is what would happen. He opened the book and found the place where it was written. Okay. Again, everybody knew it was Jesus' time, according to Jew, Jewish mind here. Everybody knew that it was Jesus' turn to read from the book of Isaiah. So. This was nothing new. This was nothing out of the ordinary. Jesus, it was his turn to read from the book of Isaiah. He took up the book, found the place where it was written. Verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, uh, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to deliver those who are crushed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's found in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. Now, here in the, little, the notes here says that the NU manuscripts omits to heal the brokenhearted. Again, normally speaking, people believe that the NU manuscripts were the oldest manuscripts. So, uh, scholars believe that, at least some scholars believe that whatever is not in the... Um, and new manuscripts is what was added at a later date. So uh, it says here, and you omits to heal the brokenhearted. So it could have been that the original uh, manuscript of uh, the, the original um, document of, of Luke uh, left that one uh, phrase out. Uh, and later on, someone just added it in there just to, just to follow through with the actual, the, the, the quote uh, of Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2 to make it more in line with that quote. As I always say in all of my um, uh, commentaries about this kind of stuff, whenever you have one book in the Bible quoting another book, usually it's not verbatim. It's not letter by letter, word for word. It's always like sometimes they do leave phrases out. Sometimes they do leave words out. And, and, and so uh, it's not always like letter of the law, kind of just very, very uh, strictly quoted like that. So uh, you need to keep that in mind. 
uh, how these, these documents were written. Verse 20, he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to, to tell them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All testified about him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? In other words, hey, like, we grew up with this, with this boy. Who does he think he is? He's the he's the he's the boy we saw playing. He's the boy. He's the baby we heard crying. He, you know, he's the he's the the one that hung out with the, with the rest of our, our our children. Isn't this Joseph's son? We know Joseph. We know him. Uh, this isn't some mighty god out of you know a mighty celebrity here. Uh, this is just Yeshua. Verse twenty three. He said to them. Doubtless you will tell me this parable. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done at Kafir Nahum, do also here in your hometown. He said, most certainly I tell you, no prophet is acceptable in his, in his hometown. But truly I tell you, there, are many, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Eliyahu, Elijah. When the sky was shut up three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, Elijah was sent to none of them except Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet none of them was cleansed except Nahaman, the Syrian. Hmm... So what Jesus is saying here, his point is this. There is the, what is, has been coined, the sin of familiarity, okay? Oh, well, I'm familiar with Jesus. I'm familiar with Yeshua. He's, he's our nephew. He's our cousin. He's our, you know, he's, he's our friend, you know. Um, you know, uh, it says here that, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and the great famine came, came over all the land. Verse 26, But Elijah was sent to none of them except Zarephath in the, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Okay? That's because these people were, they were too blinded by their familiarity. It's like, oh, Eliyahu, oh, Elijah, he's just that old uh, crazy old man that lives across the street. Oh, he's just that fanatic that lives next door. Oh, he's just an Uncle Elijah. Oh, you know, oh, what's, what's so great about him? You know, uh, he's my brother. You know, oh, he's, uh, you know, he's my cousin. You know, oh, I know him. I mean, what's so great about him? There's nothing that great about him. Oh, yeah? They missed out on one of the greatest men of God that ever were to grace the, the, the face of this earth because of their familiarity and their blindness to see exactly who Elijah really was. Even today, and there's a lot of men of God that are not honored because, you know, oh, he's just my next door neighbor. Oh, he's from the same city as I'm from. You know, he's, uh, he's from the same country as I'm from. You know, uh, so, yeah, I, you know, what's so great about him? You, you know, hey, you could be missing out on a whole lot, okay? Know this, that God Almighty, the most powerful man in the universe, can be speaking through your son, through your brother, through your father, through your cousin, through your neighbor, don't forget that. If you, if you don't get that, you can be missing out on one of the greatest blessings you will ever have in your life. Same with, it says here in verse 27, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet none of them was cleansed. None of them was healed. None of them got healed except Nahman the Syrian because he wasn't even from Israel. He was from a different country. 
Verse 28, they were all filled with wrath in the synagogue. Isn't that just typical? You go to church or you go to synagogue or these religious people, you tell them the truth and they get angry. And Jesus said, woe to you when men speak well of you. Woe to you when men speak well of you. Oh, well, you know, Johnny boy, everybody loves him in church. If they do, he probably isn't a very good man. They were all filled with wrath in the, in the synagogue as they heard these things. They rose up, threw him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill that, was, that their city was built on, that they might throw him off the cliff. You! I mean, they had murder on their minds. They thought Jesus was deserving of death. Verse 30, But he, passing through the middle of them, went his way. Listen, my friend. If you got someone that wants to kill you, <laughs> rejoice! Rejoice! They wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill the prophets. Jesus said, you know, blessed are you when men persecute you, revile you. What's revile mean? You know, speak evil, to say evil things against you. Blessed are you. Because that's the way they treated the prophets of old. Some of the greatest and most powerful men, the greatest men that have ever lived. It's a blessing. Verse 30. But he, passing through the middle of them, went his way. See, God protected him. God protected Jesus at that point in time. God almost made him invisible. And I pray that he does that for me and for you. For all of you who really preach the word of God in truth as you're supposed to be doing. Okay? Oh, yeah, they'll get super mad at you. Oh, yes, they will say hateful things against you. Oh, yes, they will say a lot of evil things and lies about you. You can expect that. That's just what's going to happen. But I pray that God bless you so that you can just pass right through the middle of them without even being detected. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 31. He came down to Kafir Nahum. That it would be, Kafir means uh, the village, Nahum, Nahum, the village of the prophet Nahum, a city of Galilee. He was teaching them on Shabbat. He was teaching them on the Sabbath day. And they were astonished at his teaching. For, with, for his word was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Ah, what have we to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Let me stop right here for a second. There's a lot of atheists that, <laughs> that won't even say that. Atheists are even worse off than, than the evil spirits. I mean, even, even evil spirits know, uh, believe in Jesus and, and know that he's the Holy One of God. Verse 35. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the middle of them, he came out of him, having done him no harm. Verse 36, amazement came on all, and they spoke together, one with another, saying, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. News about him went out into every place of the surrounding region. He rose up from the synagogue and entered into Shimon's house, Shimon's Mother-in-law was afflicted with a great fever. Now, Shimon would be Simon. This would be Kepha, or also known as Peter. So his, his mother-in-law was afflicted with a great fever. Peter was married. Okay? This is quite interesting because, because the, Cat, the Roman Catholic Church says that Peter was the first pope. The first pope was married. The Roman Catholic Church believes that popes should not be married. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder. Anyway. And they begged him for her. 
He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she rose up and served them. That's what, th that's what you should do. Or, you know, when, when God blesses you, serve, serve the Lord. Verse 40, when the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. 41, demons also came out of many, demons being evil spirits, okay? These are personalities. These are entities. These are invisible personalities, almost like ghosts, that have their own mind, their own will, their own intellect, their own feelings, emotions, okay? So evil spirits came out of many crying and saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. Rebuking, rebuking them, he didn't allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. Again, you see how Jesus didn't want to be publicized like this, how a lot of pastors do today. Jesus didn't want to be publicized. Verse 42, when it was day, he departed and went into the, an uninhabited place. And the multitudes looked for him and came to him and held on to him so that he wouldn't go away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom, of God's kingdom, to the other cities also. For this reason I have been sent. His preaching, he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Again, I will say this again, and I've said this so many times, but look at it. Jesus preached in the synagogues. The Christians preached in the synagogues. The book of Acts church went to synagogue. They didn't have their own little church building, their steeple and pews and whatever else, and little hymn books or, or, or Christian, you know, uh, Christian worship songs or Christian choruses. They didn't have that. They sang the Psalms in there entirely, which means not just the pretty verses, but also the verses that speak of God's wrath against the sinner, God's anger and hatred against, actually it says God is angry with the sinners, with, with, with the sinner every day. God hates all workers of iniquity. That's what the Psalm says, okay? I, I, you, I'm just telling you what the Holy Scriptures say. Just telling you what the Bible says. These people, when they had their services, they sang psalms, the whole psalm in their entirety. They went to synagogue. Okay? They went to the Jewish places of worship. They didn't create their own. This, my friend, is Bible. This is biblical Christianity. It's what you're not going to hear in churches today. So again, as you go and you think about what was taught here and read here today, be blessed. May God enlighten the eyes of your understanding, give you wisdom and great knowledge. As it says in Acts chapter 7, wisdom at, like, like Stephen had. So much wisdom and so much knowledge and just so much power that your enemies cannot resist you by the wisdom that you have. God bless you and make you strong in spirit as you grow in Him. Thanks again.